My name uh, is Rollings, and I'm with Agribusiness Media. For those who missed my introduction, and um, we're also going live, or we are now going live on our Agribusiness Media Facebook page. So, if you want to take advantage of this haymaking season, you are in the right place and at the right time. And uh, be assured that today we have excellent experts to attend to your questions and to your uh, need for information on hay making. So in this masterclass, you will learn how to make quality hay for your animals and also for sale. Um, and the tentative program of the masterclass runs from 10 to 11 minutes for an hour. And we are going to have presentations from our experts today, starting off with Mr. Dube, He's a lecturer at Gwebi Agricultural College, and I'm sure you have met some extension officers in the field, and maybe you have wondered where these extension officers get their knowledge from. So Mr. Dube is one of the best lecturers who work very hard to ensure that uh, our extension officers are equipped with the right knowledge and experience to be able to assist us at our farms. We also have Mr. Dube, uh, and he will cover the harvesting. Um, okay, Mr. Dube, he, he will cover the harvesting, processing, and storage of hay. And uh, he'll cover that in 20 minutes. After Mr. Dube, we will have Mr. Moyo. He is from Henderson Research uh, Station. Uh, Mr. Moyo is contributing a lot in the agricultural industry by investing more time, more energy in research, which is very key. Uh, in promoting our agricultural productivity. Mr. Moyo today will cover the importance of hay quality. So it is not only about making hay or just a grass, but there are quality issues uh, to consider. We also have uh, among our presenters, Shingirai Murerwa is the business operations manager of uh, Civ AgriSec, which is an award-winning innovative company that was recognized for introducing the first in Zimbabwe, the first hand powered bailer uh, on the Zimbabwean uh, agri tech market. So they will cover the use of manual hay bailers and also the economics and marketing of uh, producing hay. So to all farmers and to all, or to everyone who is attending this webinar, we will give you a chance to ask questions right at the end of the presentations. And this is to allow a smooth transition between the presenters. So we will have a question and answer session uh, after all presenters. So if you have any question and watching on uh, live on our YouTube page, uh, just type in the comment section uh, your question and we will capture it from this end. And if you are watching live on Zoom, uh, just use the chat uh, box or the chat session, uh, the chat section and type in your question so that we will, uh, our experts will be able to attend to uh, those questions uh, in the question and answer session. And just a reminder that if you are not presenting, please turn off your audio and also your video to avoid uh, interruptions. And our admins will also try to, call to, to, to control that from this end. So without wasting uh, time, we'll go straight into our first presentations. Uh, free, uh, first presentation from Mr. Dube, uh, Gwebi Agricultural College in the next 20 minutes. He will cover the harvesting, the processing, and also the storage of uh, hay. Uh, Mr. Dube, you can go for it. Yes. Okay, so in terms of uh, yes, I am able to see your screen. hay making, we know that uh, due to uh, climate change, there is need for hay making uh, and hay is the main feed and also a supplementary feeding for our livestock. It has become more important than ever due to uh, the climate change. And we've noticed that most farmers find it very difficult to make their own hay, and others have limited knowledge on uh, 
good quality hay. So the main objective when making hay is to, is to capture and preserve the, nutri the, the nutrients in a storable form. And uh, this we have to achieve with minimum expenditure or at a minimum cost. And reason why we feed our animals with nutritious hay is to reduce on feed costs and also uh, to, to, to ensure that they survive during uh, the periods of, uh, of, of, of drought. The process of making hay is far from just cutting and baling. Efficiently processing hay results in a good quality feed that will be available for our livestock. And this is mainly so because uh, hay is the main feed in livestock farms and uh, commercial feed being a, a supplement. Perhaps we can start off with a definition of uh, hay. What is hay? Hay is defined as grass, as legumes, or any other nutritious plants that have been cut at flowering stage. And after cutting at uh, flowering stage, they are dried and stored as feed for our animals. There are, however, different types of hay. It's not just any grass or any legume or any nutritious plant. The difference mainly in the hay making uh, process or the process of making hay involves, number one, the selection of uh, the grass type and also the quality of grass. Then the next stage is cutting the grass or uh, the legumes or any other nutritious plant at the right stage. It also involves curing or drying, then raking, processing, and lastly, storage. So in terms of So in terms of, uh, okay, so the, the, the slide I'm showing you, uh, there is showing the process number one up to uh, number six. So we'll go through the uh, processes. So in terms of selection, hay, as we said earlier, can be made from legumes and also grasses. But what's important is the nutritional composition when selecting the type of legume or grass to use for, for baling. In terms of legumes, lucerne is the most commonly used uh, legume in forage making and mainly so because it is very high in protein. Lucerne is currently being used by many feed companies as their major feed component. It is then followed by clovers and most clovers have a highly uh, palatable and they are similar to the same in terms of their nutritional value. But clover hay can be used, can also be used in feeding animals as long as the levels of protein uh, and the levels of fiber and the levels of calcium are monitored. So what I'm showing you there on the slide is the nutritional composition of um, lucerne. So you notice that um, dry matter is on average about 89.4%. Uh, uh, then you have uh, about 18.2% uh, crude protein. Then uh, you have fiber about 28.9% uh, um, of uh, the dry matter. Then uh, this is uh, the nutritional composition of, uh, uh, of lucerne, but we'll also share this uh, presentation later on to uh, your emails so that you can always uh, make reference to. So the next slide today is showing the nutritional composition of uh, uh, common uh, clovers. Uh, there is a uh, fresh red clover, there is uh, red clover hay, there is fresh white clover, there is white clover hay, uh, there is fresh crimson clover, there is crimson clover hay, 
Then what you are seeing there um, is, is tabulated as the dry meter, uh, about 22.7% uh, for the fresh red clover, then uh, for the red clover, about 87%, 17.6% for the fresh white, then uh, for the white clover, 90.7%. Then 17.6, uh, that's for fresh crimson clover, then crimson clover about 80.8. Uh, 80 but what's more important is the uh, protein uh, content. So if you look at uh, the list there, you find that um, fresh red clover is about 4.2%. Uh, then uh, red clover is about 14.1%. Then 5.0%, that's fresh white then uh, white clover hay, that's 17%, then 3% fresh crimson, then crimson clover hay, 14.8%. So the uh, crude protein content is key when selecting the uh, right uh, clover hay. So in terms of uh, grasses, grasses are lower in nutritional, in nutritional value they are low in protein, they are low in calcium, they are low in vitamins as well. This is when we compare uh, grasses to legumes. Most grasses are more palatable when fed as hay for roughage and the tropical grasses, the grasses have uh, a lower nutritional value, uh, value than temperate zone grasses. And most grasses actually contain about 0.2 to 0.4 percent of calcium and 0.2 to 0.3 percent of phosphorus. So uh, there is an illustration on um, on the nutritional composition of uh, most common uh, grasses. Uh, I will try and share uh, the slide. Okay, I'll share with you the slide with uh, the nutritional composition of uh, the most common grasses so that whenever you are trying to make your hay, you will uh, have a point of reference too. So when we were discussing or when we were highlighting on the processes of making hay, the starting point was to select the right source, uh, be it the, 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 the right legume, the right grass uh, that we we'll then use to make. Okay, so the first uh, stage is selection. And after having selected the right grass or the right uh, legume uh, to use for uh, making hay, the next stage will be cutting the hay or mowing. That's the next stage. So mowing is done when the grass is fully grown, but not over mature. This is very important. And this is usually at the first blossom or heading stage. When grass matures, what then happens is its nutritional content begins to deteriorate. The stem becomes tougher and more fibrous. And the nutritional composition begins to uh, deteriorate, as I've said. So there are more leaf, uh, leaf material in good quality hay than in bad quality hay. Mr. Mr. Moyo is going to touch on uh, the issues to do with uh, quality when, we, when he is uh, successfully connected. So if you check on the image images that I've shared, they are illustrating the process of mowing or cutting hay at the uh, right stage of, of growth. So the next stage after cutting or mowing is curing uh, or drying, then raking. So drying can be done naturally or it can be done artificially, but it has to be done for a specified period of time. If it's natural drying, it involves leaving the grass to uh, beat the grass or the legumes to dry in the fields or under a shade normally. And, and when it's done under a shade, it's meant to lose moisture down to a certain percentage, but preserving the nutritional content. And artificial uh, drying of grass is when uh, the grass or legume is allowed to cure for about two to three hours 
in the field and then turned or left for another uh, two hours. So this then reduces the moisture from about 75% to about 40%. And also the natural uh, hay drying reduces the cost of, uh, of making hay. And after that, the hay is then taken to a dryer that's, a, that's artificial now, where after being evenly spread on the floor, there are fans and heaters that are turned on to accelerate the process of drying. And uh, if you are using the artificial method of uh, drying hay, your hay should be ready in about 60 hours. But if you are using the natural way, then uh, it will actually take um, longer. But then uh, the artificial drying comes at a, at a cost. So after drying your hay, then the next stage is processing and storage. What we use to process hay is a baler. It is used to compress and make sometimes, um, uh, depending on your preference or the machinery that you have, you can make round bells or you can make square bells for, for easy storage. Remember that hay is considered a fire hazard and it should be stored far from your farm buildings. We have visited a number of farms where you find hay is stored right next to the main farm buildings. This is actually very, very uh, risky to, to your investment. So a cool and a dry place under shade is an ideal storage for your, uh, is an ideal storage facility for your, for your good quality hay. And it is important to ensure that the bells are elevated from the ground. And this is so to avoid the formation of molds uh, from moisture uh, rising from, from the ground. So this is basically the process of uh, from, select, from selecting the right uh, hay or the right grass, the right legume to uh, the storage of your, of your hay. And uh, so that I don't preempt Mr. Moyo's uh, presentation, I think I will end this here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will just continue from uh, where you have left. Uh, forage, quality of forage is quite important for our animals. And if we can, maybe we we'll first uh, define what quality is. Quality forage is the potential of a grass to be able to supply our animals with the required nutrients for that animal in particular. So it has to be quality because we need our animals to be able to get the nutrients they acquire when they were feeding hay. In most, most cases, you will find that 50% um, of the time, the animals will be grazing on, will be using hay. So they need to definitely have the quality hay that is supposed to be able to see them through. And when it comes to even times like dry season, when they don't have access to grazing, they will even get to more, more than 50% daily intake of the, the hay. So then how do we ensure that we have quality hay? Because when we don't have quality hay, there's consequences. Like you have things like uh, digestive uh, health issues. You also have things like our animals are going to lose weight. We are also going to have issues when our animals lose weight, then we're going to have issues of other diseases coming in which means in a way, a farmer is going to lose maybe animals through death or deterioration in the condition of the animals. So if you look at quality hay, it starts from, we have said, the, it was said that you start by cutting, then you dry, then you go on to uh, collect, then you go on to up to the stage whereby you're going to, to store the hay. All these stages, when not done properly, they're going to impact on the quality of hay that we're going to make. 
So what do we really mean when we talk about quality of value? You can actually visually assess the hay type if you want to know what type of hay that you have. So first of all, you will have to look at the hay and see the maturity. We are talking about the quality hay is the one that's going to have more leaves than stem in it. So we want to see more leaves in the hay than the stems. Then you go to condition. We don't want to have the, 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 the hay that's going to have uh, maybe impurities in it. You are going to have hay that is going to have maybe uh, sticks and other things combined with the hay. You're also going to have to look at color. Our hay is going to have to be bright green color. Uh, it's going to also have to be a sweet odor, uh, not the other pageant that's going to be kind of uh, the odor that's going to be not pleasing, not pleasant, I mean. So that uh, also you have to have uh, hay that's going to be free of foreign objects. It's going to be something that is going to be free of foreign objects because sometimes when we make our hay, the bailers can pick up foreign objects. They can also pick up even wires and other things. So our hay for it to be quality is going to be free of those foreign objects. And also we have to be careful when we bail, sometimes we end up picking up weeds and some weeds can be toxic. We don't want to have that kind of hay that's going to have toxic material or weeds in it because at the end of the day, it's going to also affect our animals. So I was saying we also have to be very careful with foreign material or toxic materials that's going to be poisonous to animals as we bear our hay, top quality hay has to be free of such kind of things. So like I said, it was said when it starts from cutting, Top quality hay is something you, you don't just get to top quality hay. It has to start from the cutting. Then if you are not going to cut at the right stage, then you don't have top quality hay. Right stage, like it was said previously, if you are going to cut too late, then we're going to have hay that is going to, to, to have less nutrients, maybe more on quant quality. If you're also going to cut maybe too early, the idea is to balance between the, the quantity and quality. We also trying to avoid a hay that's going to have some brown coloration or some kind of bleached kind of hay. So that shows that there is deterioration in the quality of hay. So deterioration will show in the color also of hay, which means that's low quality hay. And then also, we have a situation whereby I previously said, we want to make sure that our animals are going to get maximum nutrients or are going to get more out of the hay that we're making. So we are saying, if you look at it, if your hay is going to be maybe uh, containing about 13% crude protein, then our animals can maintain weight. But if you're going to go maybe even at 18%, they can gain weight. Anything below six to eight percent, then we've got our hay uh, being so poor quality in our animals and children. So I'm just trying to justify the reason why we need to have quality hay. Because definitely we need to cut costs on feed. And if we are not going to have quality hay, we are going to incur more costs when we're buying concentrates and other supplements to feed our animals. So the question of quality hay cannot be ruled out. It's, got, it's critical that we have quality hay because it impacts definitely on our animals and the productivity. Then after that, we are saying, if you are going to also have quality hay, you have to also look at you, the way you are going to bail or dry your hay in the field. 
is going to be something that is going to uh, be a little bit of, uh, you have to be careful. In terms, if you look at our bailing, we are going to bail during the growing season, and that is normally during the rain season. So here, we are going to have to be very careful because at times we're going to have poor quality hay because maybe we didn't make good timing in terms of our uh, bailing. You will find that most of the time it's going to rain. So for you to make good quality hay, you have to be something like, uh, you, you have to be able to look at the weather and see if you are going to control or not even control as size. Maybe the weather department, you can be consulted to see if you're going to have a prolonged kind of uh, a uh, sunny weather, then that's going to help. So I'm simply saying it starts from the way you are, the, 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 the cutting and the bailing for you to have quality hay. At the end of the day, when you get to even storage, storage is one area that can actually affect our quality or hay, or of our hay. If you're not going to store your hay properly, in terms of maybe your storage, there is a uh, no moisture, then you are going to have our hay rotting or de getting deformed and flattening out and that kind of stuff. You also have to check for your, your hay in the bun. If maybe you open up your hay and then you find that it's sticking together, then that shows that it's poor quality because maybe it was made when it has so much moisture in it. Okay, just to go through something, we're going to say, how do you get to know that uh, you are going to make proper hay in terms of maybe just in the field. You have a situation whereby maybe if you take your hay and uh, maybe the, the leaves and you try to squeeze them and then they bring out, a, the, there's water coming out, then you have to know that it's too wet. We want hay that the grass that can easily snap. The process of hay making is what determines the quality. We cannot, dissociate the quality of hay from the process of making it. Obviously the symptoms or the other visual signs that tells you that the hay is of poor quality, it, they come after the process has been done. So if you are going to make good quality hay, it's the process beginning from cutting to storage. I was just saying something like, if you are going to try and assess to see, to see whether your hay or your hay making process, process is in good order. I was just saying, if you take your, your forage and maybe you twist it and then you see water coming out, it will show you that it's too wet. And then maybe we need, when you twist it, then it snaps easily. Then you know that, okay, this is the time maybe to make it. It translates to our, 15 to about 18 percent moisture content which is good because it impacts again on our quality of hay in other words we are saying as long as we are going to make quality hay we are going to have our animals in good shape in good condition and we are going to at least reduce cost of feeding our animals Quality hay is a must whether you're going to feed your goats, your cattle, your horses, even uh, other animals that need to be fed on the farm. It cannot be overemphasized. Then coming again to visual assessment, it's, you can, it, can tell, it can tell you what poor quality hay is. But the unfortunate part of visual assessment, it cannot tell you the nutritional value of your hay. Because when we are looking at quality hay, we cannot also ignore the value of the hay. What then we need is some analysis. We can get samples of our hay to see what it contains in terms of protein, in terms of dry matter, in terms of, we are talking about digestible, totally digestible, nutrients, we are talking about uh, sugars, we're talking about all the other things that we might need for our animals, then we need to do sampling of that hay, random sampling of our bales to see if our quality conforms also to the value, nutritional value of our hay. 
because we talked about quality here. It means we need to actually look also at the nutritional value, which can only be done using analysis. So maybe it's going to be kind of very expensive because then you need the lab in the, in the kind. But then we just also need, because we cannot visually assess the nutritional value of our quality hay, of our hay, if we're going to say we've got quality hay. So in short, what I'm simply going to say is, there is no way we can talk about hay without, or make hay without looking at quality. Quality definitely is what we need. And without quality, then our hay is just something else. Okay, the animals can take it in, but it's not going to give us value in terms of what we see on the animals. What we also need is to make sure that we involve uh, the best practices of making hay. We don't actually get to be uh, careless in the way we make our hay. Even when we make hay from the natural felt, uh, there are times when maybe it's not going to be high quality, but sometimes we're just saying it's better than not having hay. But at the end of the day, if we are going to have to make hay, we're going to have to make hay that is of top quality. So at the moment, that's what I can say for now. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moyo, for that great presentation. And um, uh, it was very informative and you added very key issues to do uh, with uh, quality, uh, quality there. And uh, especially that, you know, it's not a matter of just going on the roadside and mowing hay and and uh, feeding our animals. Now we move on to our next presenter, Siv Agri EC. Hay baling is a livestock feed production activity which reduces the risk of road fires to the environment. Small scale farmers in Zimbabwe currently do not have the capacity to bale and store their own hay. As a result, this group of farmers cannot keep pure dairy breeds which have higher milk production compared to indigenous cattle. Siv Agri EC has developed the first hand powered baler on the Zimbabwean commercial market. The baler uses a simple slider crank mechanism to compress the hay in a semi continuous process with time intervals in between. The baler was designed using the latest engineering design software. This green innovation is affordable, efficient, and uses no fossil fuel. A farmer who bales can provide sufficient livestock feed to his daily cattle and also sell surplus bales on the daily farms. So good morning, everyone. And thank you to Agribusiness Media for organizing this webinar and to everyone who's managed to attend. Uh, so my name is uh, Shingrai Murerwa. I'm from Siv Agri EC. So we are an engineering consultancy and the company that developed the first and only manual hand powered hay baler in Zimbabwe. And this, this is the only hay baler you find on the agri-tech market in Zimbabwe. So let me just give you a brief background on what inspired this award-winning innovation. So in 2019, uh, during a research forum that included agropreneurs, agro-entrepreneurs, uh, a farmer from the Midlands province Midlands province in Zimbabwe um, uh, came to us and shared that farmers in, his, in their area were failing to find an effective solution for them to be able to build their grass and, and uh, provide for their livestock feed. So the only alternative that they had was a motorized a baler. And if you are familiar with it, it is very expensive and they could not afford to own one. So our engineering team and technical experts took this challenge and designed this um, manually operated hand power day baler. And we availed it to the farming community last year in 2020. So our engineering innovation um, last year was awarded the most innovative business by the International Labor Organization. And we also received the sustainability innovation and Environmental Stewardship Award from the Environmental Management Agency, EMA, uh, with collaboration with uh, CSR Network Zimbabwe. So, okay, let, right now, uh, so that uh, you also just see the baler 
uh, and the bail in action. Uh, as I continue to give you the features, I will turn you to to the bailer to, to the bailer and it being in operation, uh, so that you see you see it. So right now I'm going to run you through the the features of the the hay bailer. So it is affordable, as in if you compare to a motorized hay baler, uh, you see that a farmer uh, can save over 8,000 USD by getting our manual hand baler, because it costs just 375, of which you'd need about 9,000 USD to actually be able to own uh, a motorized hay baler. And we also see that uh, the farmer can now sustain feeding his or her livestock all year round uh, with the hay available on their farm and the surrounding environment. Right. Um, so, you know, af after, after gathering your hay, uh, as you were told that you have to go through the process of uh, cutting the grass and gathering it. When you use this baler, you can bell, uh, you can produce between 60 to 90 uh, bells in a day. And that is just in an eight hour, in an eight hour uh, working working shift. All right. Um, sorry, just to agree business media, uh, can you still hear me well and see the video of the bailer? Yes, confirm. Uh, we can see you uh, and we can hear you as well. Okay, so so that's a, uh, so just just running you through, we can see one person who's who's taking the the, the hay there, then putting it into the chamber of the hay baler. While the other one who's holding uh, the pole just, just compresses it. And as the process goes on, we've got, as you can see, a bell that's actually a bell that's actually coming out right now. So as I let me so as you can see from the process that you've just seen right now, and I've just told you, it is very easy to operate. So the mechanism uh, of this Bella technology was engineers was engineered so as to make the belling process simple and smooth. So we also know that the government um, and the world at large uh, are encouraging things that are environmental friendly. So in line with that, you we can also say that this baler is eco-friendly as it does not use any fuel. This is just uh, someone who is who is just uh, using their their hand, they're just manually operating. They're just using their energy themselves to actually be able to produce those bells. So we, um, as I said, that this was designed by our engineers and technical experts. So through coming up with the design, uh, we made sure that the bailer is actually durable and it is very easy to maintain. As in all the companies that you that you see uh, that help even the smooth operation of the baler, there is the sliding mechanism there. So all that everything that you see, the companies that you see, we actually designed and fabricated them ourselves. So this means that if any maintenance needs to be uh, needs to be done by the person who owns the baler. They can just uh, come to us and we deploy our technical expertise to actually go and assist them in any maintenance that they might need. Um, so having, having a hay baler is, very un, uh, is, a, is a very great advantage to, to the farmer. Uh, as, in, as I said before, that the farmer can now sustain feeding their livestock. Uh, and this is all year round. As, you, as was being mentioned by Mr. Moyo where you can, you can now store after, after bailing, you can store your, your bells and later when you want to use them, you, you can just provide for your livestock. Then we all know that Zimbabwe is in the, is in the region of prime grassland and much of it, we, we've noticed that was, it was being underutilized. Um, so, so a farmer by, by buying this, uh, buying the baler, uh, it means that you can now decrease on the amount that you've been spending on your livestock feed. Because now that you're producing for yourself, you don't need to keep on, you don't need to buy uh, livestock feed or buy bells from people who own motorized bailers now. So it reduces your total uh, uh, livestock feed cost and this in turn increases your profit. 
you've, you now have like a, a greater profit margin from that. Um, then also uh, we talk about uh, trying to create employment and trying to encourage entrepreneurship. So let's suppose someone buys the bailer right now and they have access to A. Watch, even if you do not own livestock or if you actually have access, you can now become a feed entrepreneur yourself. So now you can start making these A bells and you are selling them to those that, do not, that want them. You, so you're now becoming a supply to a great demand that's there in the country and surrounding areas. All right. Uh, are you still with me, uh, agribusiness agri there? Eh? Yes, a uh, very interesting presentation there, Carol. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so again, now uh, we're saying that uh, when you are when you are using the hay baler, there is little to no expense in operating. As you can see right now, um, the my, my colleague here is actually tying. Uh, like after compression, now you have to tie, tie the bell. Uh, the 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 tying on the tying process, you just need uh, there's what is called bell twine. I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with it. Or if you do not have, you can find alternatives to it. And if you take the process of using uh, bell twine, it costs uh, four dollars for three hundred meters. So if you do the math, uh, you you can. Uh, tie about you can tie about 100 bells using this 300 meter uh, bell twine, uh, which basically means you are using four cents only per bell. So that is the cost that you are using to actually have your your own hay bells. So that is little to no expense at all. So that is, this is very advantageous to to someone. And now if you owning the hay baler, you now have. Uh, you can now can be able, as was being said by Mr. Moyo, uh, to, to be able to store the air bells. Now you've got uh, storage capability. So we can all agree that this is a great investment. This hay baler, because of how easy it is to operate, uh, how durable it is, uh, then the cost of it, then how you, you increase your profit margin, how you lower your expenses. This is a really great uh, investment that a person can make and um you know if, even when you think about uh, what what you can ask is that you can leave to people you you live or your kids and all that uh we've got a poster that you actually put out where if the if you are sure now you'd understand that uh we said pretty having a bailer you have a naka right so if you understand shona it means what it basically means is you have something an asset and investment that you can now leave for your children and your children's children to actually uh, make, make make use of. So yeah, this is what we have. Uh, this is this is the bailer, and and it's it, it's it's really good for you to have. So I think people would need to to know. Like I, I think I mentioned it before, but maybe no one had had. As in the question would be how much it is to own one. So this hay bailer costs three hundred and seventy five US dollars only. And as I explained that there is no need for fuel, it's manually operated. So this is, uh, this is just the cost that you pay once and you can profit from for a lot of years after. Then the good part is we are actually holding a promotion right now where we are selling it at $350. That's $25 off from the original price. So this is a good time for someone who has the money to invest in it right now to actually get in touch with us and they can actually own one themselves. And we have also offer after sales support. That means that if you ever find a problem um, that you need to be attended to, as I said, we deploy technical expertise to come through and, and, and assist. Um, then um, you also, uh, what you also should know uh, is that uh, when you actually buy the, the bailer, uh, as you said, I, I think as I was doing my presentation, you were seeing the process being done. You might not have seen every stage of it as it was happening. So what we do is after you buy, we also give you an instructional video where you actually see every process slowly that you can follow wherever you are. And if you ever need someone to come through, to actually come to your farm, to actually help you through it, you can call us, then we make an arrangement. Then our technical people will also come and 
uh, do a training to people who will be operating by your farm. All right. So um, our, our agribusiness also asked me to share with everyone what are the services that we actually offer. So as I explained to you that Steve Agri EC is an engineering consultancy. So right now we're majoring mostly into agricultural engineering. So as an agricultural engineering company, we help in all agri, agro based agro related problems that any farmer might be facing. Then we assist you, we consult on what best processes uh, to use uh, what, what, anything that you might need uh, that to actually increase your, your, your profit and make it easy for you to operate your processes on our production and all. Then we are also doing greenhouses. Um, is that right now we actually are the, one of the only people who are doing greenhouses in Manikaland and we're doing them all over Zimbabwe. And these greenhouses, we are valuing them at $4.50 50 per square meter. So yeah, so those those are those are the services that we offer. And for any like for the people who might want to know how to get in touch with us, I will just share with you right now um, like two numbers that you can call or send WhatsApp on. So if people are ready to just write down, I'll just say slowly. So if you want to call a WhatsApp, you can call on. Five five seven zero six three. I will say it again zero seven eight two five five seven zero six three. And the other one, the other number that you can uh, you can use is zero seven eight three five three seven five nine seven. I'll repeat that zero seven eight three five three seven. 597. Right. Uh, so I would like to thank you once again, uh, AgriMedia for Agribusiness Media for this and to anyone who's attended and would love you all, everyone who's attended to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. You just type Steve Agri EC, then you see us, you like our page, you follow us and we'll keep on bringing you more products that will make your farming activities great. Thank you very much, Agribusiness Media. I'll bring it back to you. I have a quick question. Well, th Hi. thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a great presentation uh, and that's uh, innovation for sure. And uh, the numbers again for uh, uh, Caesar Greek is uh, 0782-557-063. And uh, 0783 537 597. So, uh, so, if you want uh, to contact them, uh, those are their contacts. Uh, and whilst you are still there, Shingirai, uh, there's a question here as we are also going now into our question and answer session. Uh, they are saying okay. what is the size of the bell in terms of the dimensions. The size of the bell. Yes, the bells that right. are produced by your machine. All right. So they are zero point or zero point eight in length. Zero point eight meters in length. Uh, do 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 you are you can you do you still have my video there or it's just audio? Yes, yes, yes. It's um, it's it, we can see it. All right. Okay. So I, I think right now you can see that the ones that are being made as we're going through the presentation. So for the length is, is at 0 0.8. Um, okay. My colleague here is actually is taking a tape measure. Uh, you can see that. Yes, yes, we can see. Um, uh, perhaps maybe if they can uh, say out loud the measurements. It's actually oh, 0 0.9 meters. The 0.9 one... meters. The one we produced whilst uh, the live stream was going on. Right. So the one we just produced right now as we're going through is 0 0.9 meters. So you're saying could you make it between 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 meters? And the kgs, the weight is like our 12 to 14 kgs. Okay, okay. Uh, that's great. 
so you are saying you did a bill whilst you were present uh, you, were, you, you were presenting. Yes, if, if people were actually following on the video, I was showing the process and with this uh, the bells that we were making as we were presenting. Wow, this is great. This is great. Uh, thank you uh, for, for, for that innovation. And I see there are a number of questions that are coming through here. There's another one that's saying, uh, uh, how much does the whole equipment weigh since I may have to carry it around? Roughly, what's, uh, what's the weight around 5 kgs, 10 kgs? No, it's around 90 kgs. 90 kgs, okay. Yes. So that's the yeah, way. And, and the, the baler, and, so, sorry, sorry, uh, the baler itself is, is two meters, is two meters long. Okay, all right, uh, great. Uh, then uh, there's another question here. Uh, it's saying, uh, just hold on, just hold on. It's saying, uh, can your haymaker be elevated off the ground? I think there is a risk of packing soil into the bell. Uh, sorry, I did not understand that. Okay, it's. Uh, I think I it's. Get that. Okay, saying can your haymaker be elevated off the ground? Yes. Is, uh, citing it, a it, risk of packing soil into the bell. All right. Okay. Uh, I, my my colleague wants to uh, answer you here. Yes, okay. um, the bale I can elevate it off the ground, but uh, um, uh, as, as you could see, uh, whilst we're baling, there's actually no risk of there being soil uh, in the in the bale itself. So um, the, the base of the bale is actually a flat covered surface. So the grass is actually going on top of a wooden base, not on the ground. So as you bale, as the, as the air is compressed, it's actually, uh, there's actually a wooden base underneath. So there's no risk of any soil going into the hay, but it, it would be a good idea to just elevate it a bit. Uh, for demonstration of purposes, we just wanted to have it outside where everyone can see what's actually going on. Okay, uh, well done guys. Uh, thank you very much for, for that presentation. Uh, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to do so. Okay, you're welcome. Then um, we have, uh, now that we are in our question and answer, uh, session, um, uh, Mr. Moyo, uh, there are some questions that farmers have sent uh, through the chat section, section here. Um, one is saying, please advise on the duration one has to leave cut hay in the field to dry naturally. Okay, uh, thanks, Gwebi uh, has responded that uh, for three days. So in just three days, uh, your hay should be uh, ready uh, for, for uh, processing. Then another one is, are we going to receive a recording? Sure, definitely we are recording this webinar and after editing, we'll definitely send to your email. So I'd like to encourage you to send your email uh, addresses or to type in your email addresses in the, in the chat uh, section. Okay, so three days, um, okay, three days in a sunny weather uh, are sufficient to dry your hay. That's from baby. Then uh, another question, how many animals are fed? Hello? Yes, hello? Now I can get you. Ah, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Moyo. I think the question was, uh, what is clover hay? Clover, I will start by um, mentioning what clover is. Clovers are legumes, which are high in protein content than grass. And many types of clovers can be used for hay making. Um, and uh, the only thing about clovers is that they're kind of difficult to dry. We have got uh, like white clover, which is trifolium ripens, and uh, we've got uh, um, Egyptian, crimson red, we've got besom. Uh, these ones can also be made to make hay, can also be used to make hay. But uh, like I said, they are gen generally not easy to dry. Drying can be completed at the farm once the first part of the drying has been completed. Yeah, clover is also prone to 
to moans. That's what I can say for now for clover. Yeah. We have what you also have sweet clovers, which are annual or biennial. It's a clover, but it's an annual and or a biennial. But otherwise, it's a clover. That's what I can say for clovers now. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moyo, for shedding more light on, on, on that one. Then is it possible yes. to improve a poor nutrient, poor nutrient content bell or a poor bell to a better quality bell? Say, yes. I... Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. You were saying, is it possible to improve a poor quality uh, bell into a better quality bell? Yes. I think, yes, by, by using uh, a salt, or we can also use, uh, you can also treat using urea. Okay. So you look at, uh, because you are talking about palatability, so we can use for those uh, poor quality uh, material, we can treat using urea, or you can treat using salt. Okay, uh, thank you for responding to that one. Then are there any tools that can be used to measure moisture content for baling? Uh, tools, I think for now, what I can say, they should be tools like probes, the probes that you can use to, 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 to measure uh, soil, more, to measure moisture. But then I think, those ones could be uh, with the, this new technology. There must be some, but I, rem I remember we used to have probes that we used to measure for other things like silage, and but those things are there. I can't specifically say what type of probe at the moment, but they are there. Ah, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, then uh, there's another comment here saying. Um, I think it should be noted that hay quality for dairy is going to be different for hay quality is going to be different for dairy and beef cattle. So if uh, for dairy it's golden hay, but for beef we encourage uh, the process called, um, okay. Is there a difference, uh, Mr. Moyo, between the quality of hay that's required for dairy beef or for dairy cattle and that's um, required for, 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 for beef cattle. Yes, for now, what I can say is uh, we need uh, high quality hay for, for dairy. Dairy, definitely, we need high quality hay as compared to our beef animals. Our beef animals can do with poor quality hay. Poor quality hay can do with animals. But for dairy, we definitely need high quality hay for those that are milk producing animals. And uh, we need to make sure that our hay suits what they need. Because remember, every animal is, is we've got to be specific. We cannot say what is good for dairy is uh, also going to be good for, for beef in the likes. So we are saying we have to look at animals individually. But for now, I can say we need high quality hay for our dead animals. As for beef, they can do with poor quality. But I'm not saying beef should be fed poor quality. I'm saying if there's no choice, beef can do with poor quality. But dairy, we need high quality hay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, taking that one. Then um, uh, let me check if we, okay, can we have soft copies of the presentations? Yes, we are going to send you a recorded uh, webinar. Then another question, um, the size of the bells, okay, it has been addressed. Okay, so in the interest of our uh, time, uh, we would like to thank everyone for attending uh, this uh, webinar and uh, agribusiness media would like to thank all presenters for the in-depth uh, presentations as well as researched uh, content uh, from Mr. Moyo, uh, from Shingrai, as well as comments from Mr. Dube, uh, who is at uh, Chibero College. Thank you very much for uh, the great presentations. And to our participants, thank you all for joining this webinar and we hope 
that you have benefited from the great presentations by uh, the uh, experts in the industry. Uh, we also have posted a link to our agribusiness talk uh, groups where we discuss the business of farming. Uh, please click that link for instructions on how to join. It's free. You don't pay anything to uh, be part of uh, these farm uh, business discussions. So we will end the meeting uh, in a minute and we will post more information on the upcoming webinars in our groups. Uh, from agribusiness media, I am Rollings. Enjoy your day. Move Nezwarakanaka, Libengelange, Elife. Thank you very much. Muskere Zakanaka.